to me, comedy, right? It was like saying I want to be an astronaut. It's like saying I want to be a movie star. It's like ridiculous. I didn't know anybody. It seemed like embarrassing to say to people, I want to be a comedy writer. It's still embarrassing. Let's be honest. I'm Sharla Lariston, a stand-up comedian, writer, director, and producer. And this is The Working Writer Podcast, where screenwriters, creatives, and industry insiders share their stories of breaking in in hopes that it helps you along your path. I'm so excited you could join us. If you like what you hear, don't forget to like, subscribe, and share. Without further ado, let's get to work. Welcome back to the Working Writer Podcast. Thank you so much for tuning in. I'm excited for you to check out this episode with comedy writer Leo Allen. If you're a hardcore comedy nerd, then you might already know who he is. Leo is a writer and producer who's written for the likes of SNL, Nathan For You, Comedy Bang Bang, Human Giant, and so many others. I first learned about Leo when I started going to Whiplash It was a free stand-up comedy show at UCB in New York City that happened on Monday nights at 11 p.m. at night. I remember the first time I went to Whiplash, I was a new comedian and I'd only been doing improv for a few years and I had just started doing stand-up. Whiplash was one of those shows that everybody talked about and so I knew it was a good show, but I didn't know it was like a legendary show until I actually went there. The first show I went to, I saw Chris Rock. And then the next time I went, I saw NZ Zansari, Hannibal Burris. I saw Amy Schumer. Just so many huge comedians. Leo was the host of the show and he had just the most whimsical way about him. You would never know that this was like a huge deal of a show with these mega stars just based off of how chill Leo was. His jokes were always very silly and very stupid and I immediately became his biggest fan. I was lucky enough to work with Leo on season two of Ghosted, the Fox show with Adam Scott and Craig Robinson. Leo turned in one of the best scripts of the season. It was truly like nothing I'd ever seen before. Usually when you turn in your episode to the writer's room, everyone goes off and reads it and we all come back with a bunch of notes and we do usually a substantial rewrite. But that's not what happened when we read Leo's script in that writer's room. We came back and our showrunner was just like, this is great. He changed two words and that was it. So he's a bit of a legend in my book and a pretty big deal. But again, you'd never know it based on how chill this guy is. He's truly surfer level chill. In this episode, we talk about how Leo's been doing comedy for pretty much forever. And we chat about how he wishes he had taken the business side of comedy a little bit more seriously. And speaking of taking your writing career seriously, before we get to the episode, I wanted to let you know about a little change I'm making at the Working Writer School. As you know, I was so naive about the business part of Hollywood when I first entered. So I'm on a mission to teach writers how to become creative entrepreneurs who thrive in their TV writing careers. In an effort to make the course accessible to everyone who wants to learn, right now for $49 a month or $4.95 a year, you'll get access to the full course library and exclusive events at the Working Writer School. I know there are a million subscription services out there, but I think this model will make the course accessible to many more people while making it sustainable for me. As you know, breaking into TV can take several years, so I wanted to create something that could support creatives over the long term of their journey. With this model, you can dip in and dip out as much as you'd like, plus you can cancel any time. And everybody wins because anyone who purchased the course before this new change will continue to have lifetime access. So if you're curious about the Working Writer School, this is a great opportunity to check it out without any risk. When you purchase a membership, you'll have full access to the library of courses that cover topics like how to get repped, how to pitch a TV show, how to manage your money as a creative, how to create your own productivity system so you can start and finish your projects on autopilot and so much more. Here's what former student Jay Burlingham had to say about the course. This course has given me a map that I will return to again and again as I move forward in my career as a writer. It's not just about how a writer's room works and how the industry works. It's about how to be the person who gets there, who moves beyond it, and who builds a productive and rewarding career. Another student, Jordana Jason, said, becoming aware that there are so many skills outside of just the craft of writing and comedy that are crucial to your success is so important. 
every creative needs to understand that writing and creating is just one component of being in the industry. And this class definitely helps to fill that gap. If you feel stuck or as if you don't know what move to make next, I would definitely recommend this class. Even if you feel you are progressing well in your career, Sharla uses her lived experience to help you avoid common mistakes. If you'd like to learn more about the course, you can check it out at theworkingwriter.com slash school. That's T-H-E-W-E-R-K-I-N-G-W-R-I-T-E-R.com slash school. That's all I've got on that. And now, without any further ado, here's the episode with the wonderful Leo Allen. Leo Allen, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming on. So I learned from doing my a little bit of research, even though I've known you for quite a few years, uh, that you're from Middleborough or that you were born in Middleborough, Massachusetts. Did you know that I'm from Taunton, Massachusetts? Did we ever talk about this? No, no. I'm actually, I was born in Michigan. I lived in Jersey for a few years, but then I mostly grew up in Pennsylvania since I was seven. That's like a false, I didn't put that up anywhere. And I don't know why somebody put it up there, but I kind of love that it's wrong. But I grew up in Pennsylvania. There's misinformation out there about you. What a random, insane Yeah, there's thing. A, it's all misinformation. I like so it. nothing about your Wikipedia is correct? What's true? Well, I don't know. I haven't looked at it for a long time, so I don't know. what. what, right. what but I definitely, I grew up in Pennsylvania. There's no mention of Pennsylvania on Wikipedia. So it seems mostly correct based off of your bio. It's just the Middleborough part. Yeah, I don't know how somebody got Middleborough. I was like, if you were from Middleborough, I would have known that. That's something we would have connected on. Where's Taunton? Taunton is su- southern Massachusetts. It's like right next to Rhode Island. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And Middleborough is, it's also southern mass. So all these uh, southern mass holes know each other. You know, it's like a, <laughs> definitely a big connection. Yeah, it's true. It's a try. Yeah. But you're, you're um, an well, East Coaster, so. I'm very much an East Coaster. Me but too. But Michigan Me is too. not East Coast at all. No, but I only lived there for like less than two years. What were you guys doing over there? In Michigan? Yeah. My parents are from Detroit, and then I was born right outside of Detroit. My dad got a job, or he had a few jobs, and eventually ended up in Pennsylvania. But he worked in Delaware. But we lived, like, right across the line from Delaware and Pennsylvania. All right. Cool. Then then I was like, get me out of here. But now when I go back, I, I, I love it now. Now I'm like, this is beautiful. It's nice. Well, let's let's make our way there and let's start with how you got started with writing or with comedy. Which one came first? I always liked writing. Or I thought I did, but I I kind of just moved to New York because I wanted to live in New York. And I I think I secretly wanted to be a comedian, but I was too afraid to like admit it. And I think I was. Well, I think I wanted to be a comedy writer, but I didn't know anybody and there was no internet then. And I didn't, it seemed like a job that it didn't seem like a job that no one I knew or had any contact with had ever known anybody who'd done anything like that. So I had two friends from two different colleges I went to and they both wanted to be actors. So they were moving to New York and I was like, oh, I'll go with you guys. And (laughs) I mean, I like the idea of being an actor, but that seemed too impossible to me. So I wasn't like, they went to the neighborhood playhouse to acting school, but I was like, that's too crazy. I'll just do, I don't, I don't, I had no plan. I was just uh, (laughs) broke and nervous and just like, but I like I wanted to live in New York, and they, so they, we got a place in Hoboken. And the three of us lived in Hoboken. But I lived in Israel for a year. I moved to Israel and just like worked, just because I wanted to travel, and it was free. I mean, it wasn't free. I just had to pay for my plane ticket, and then I did like I worked on an old on an old pond, which is like you work on a farm, so I could kind of travel around. Wait, what I is this called? Again? I, this is called something, it, right? It's called. Uh, no, it's before. You're probably thinking of birthright, which is like a thing yeah, they birthright. do now. Mm-hmm. But that was right. that didn't that didn't exist when I did this. Okay. I, I did this because a friend of mine who was a little older had done it, and he he sort of hooked me up with. They had an office in Philly. I was living in Philly, 
and they had an office in Philly and they hooked me up with this program. I just enrolled in this program where you went over and you like, you worked half the time and you studied half the time. And so I was you there are, Jew- like are you months. Jewish? I am Jewish. Yeah. Okay. So this is for yeah. Jewish people. This is not just like a thing that anybody could do. Um, just... That's a good question. I'll bet anybody could have done it, but it was, yeah, they were primarily okay. like, they were primarily like, uh, yeah, trying to like, you know, cement the relationship between Americans and Israelis, I think was the All right. Idea so after behind. college, you're saying after college. This is right after you decided, college. This is right after college. Your friends I moved to Hoboken. You decided well, they, to, yeah, to Israel. They, they, I don't know what they were doing for like six months. They were, well, one was like a year ahead of me. And then, like, while I was in Israel, they were figuring this out. Like, they were both going to go to school at the neighborhood playhouse. And I was, cool. I was basically moved to Israel because I, like, didn't know what I wanted to do with my life. And I, I thought it would be good to travel. And then and this how was, was This was, like, travel? affordable. It was great. I mean, I just – I went there and, like, I, I lived with uh, – like 30 people were on, in my class who are like kind of my age. And I think like 20 of them were Russians who had emigrated. And then there were some Americans and like South Africans and English and uh, Australians. There were some Australians and we all just kind of lived in this old pond house together, like 30 or 40, maybe there was more like 40 or 50 of us. Wait, were all these people Jewish or were all, they all kind yeah, of Yeah, they were all different Jews. People? They were all Jews I from different places. I think they were places. mostly all Jews and maybe some of the Russians weren't, but they maybe okay. they had to be. I don't know. I can't remember, but it, it wasn't like It seems like they kind of had to be. <laughs> it, it wasn't like it wasn't like is... anybody was doing anything religious or talking about right, it right. or anything. It was very like secular. All right. All right. Yeah. But you would get up in the morning, you would go to work at like wherever you were like some, sometimes I worked in the kitchen doing the dishes. Sometimes I worked like they had an irrigation factory. You had to work the shifts at the the irrigation factory. Like you could have to get work overnight or or I worked at, they had like a a chicken house. You had to work in there or they planted, (laughs) they planted avocados. They planted watermelons. They had a whole bunch of like, there's a mango, uh, there was uh, banana trees. There was like a whole bunch of like different jobs you would have. This so sounds really kind of idyllic. Yeah. It was kind of idyllic. It was nice to have something to do. And then you'd study. You learned the Hebrew half the time. So you learned Hebrew, but not in a religious context, just the, the language. No, no, no. Just the yeah. language in it. it right. And, uh, that was good because you were in because then you could talk to the Russians. So we had the incentive to learn because some of them could speak English, but not many. Hmm. So yeah, it was just a real you know, eye-opening experience to meet people from all over the world. And you know, it was, when you had gone good. to college, was it was it a bunch of like local people that you were around? Was this the first time you were around different kinds of people? Well, I went to University of Michigan for a couple of years, which I didn't really like. I think just because I probably didn't really want to go to college, or I, I don't know, I just had no idea what I wanted to do. And Michigan was massive, and I was just like overwhelmed. I think so. I quit there after a couple of years, and then I went to Temple University in Philly, which I liked more, I think just because I sort of more took things I was interested in class wise. And and it was, I liked being in the city and it was, it was way more diverse. It was, it was like a public school. I mean, University of Michigan is a public school too. So I don't know. I think I, I think it's mostly, I liked being in a city. I like being in Philly. Mm -hmm. Uh, It was a good practice for New York. It was kind of okay. the same idea. Um, and I knew Philadelphia a little bit because I had lived, you know, I grew up like less than an hour from there, probably drive. So I'd oh. been there a bunch. So I kind of knew it a little bit. So what happens after you go to Israel? You have this very eye-opening experience. You meet all these different people. Do you come back? 
do you go back to you go back to the states or do you travel? That, yeah, you? that's when I go back to the states. That's when I go back to the states and move to Hoboken with my two friends who are going to the neighborhood playhouse in New York City. And then I was depressed and <laughs> didn't know what I was going to do. And <laughs> I appreciate broke. you keeping and it real. Yeah. <laughs> just, a, just a, you know, that first time you're an adult, you're like, oh yeah, I'm 20. How old was I? I was probably 23. Yeah. And I was like, oh yeah, what am I going to do? And I have no money. I got to like figure out how to pay for stuff. <laughs> I don't it like, sucks. what am I, what am I going to do? Like, I mean, I mean it's we exciting. Like, it's so exciting, but it sucks. Yeah. It was exciting, but I found it like really overwhelming and uh, it was really dark for a while. But then I started to like, then I got a job, which is helpful because I had something to do. And then I like, I kind of knew I wanted to like be a comedy writer, whatever that meant. So I like, I wrote to a guy. I wrote to this guy. And just so, was, just so everybody knows, because this is not going to be on video, but um, Leo just used air quotes when he said comedy writer, even though that is a very legitimate thing <laughs> that people do. Well, it's, to me, uh, comedy writer, it like, it's like saying I want to be an astronaut. It's like, it's like saying I want to be a That is star. also a thing that people do. <laughs> well, astronaut is, but like, you know, movie star, it's like ridiculous. Like, I didn't yeah. know anybody. It seemed like, it seemed like, it seemed like embarrassing to say to people, I want to be a comedy It's embarrassing. I, mean, I have the exact an, same experience. Still embar- it's still embarrassing. Yeah. Let's no, I, 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 I'm a, I have the exact same, you know, experience. I did not want to tell anybody that I wanted to do comedy. I literally didn't even admit it to myself until long after I was doing it for a while. And it is, it, it does feel like a kind of a ridiculous thing to say that you want to do, but still not does not warrant air quotes, but <laughs> no, you're yeah, right. Go this ahead. Is, so this is like talking, this is like talk, this is like talking to it's my It's not therapist. an imaginary job. <laughs> no. Yeah. We'll get it's to your a, therapist in a bit. Yeah. So, yeah. We'll so then I, what did I do? I, I, I had a job, so that was good because I had something to do. And then I, I was, I I bought this book at the bookstore, like how to write comedy for TV. I can't remember what it's called, but it's this guy, Gene Perre, who, okay. who, um, he was a comedy writer who had written for like Bob Hope and Carol Burnett. And like, he wrote this book and I actually did all the exercises. And he said in the book, like, if you do any, if you do these exercises, you are uh, in the 1%. Like, of everybody who even bothers to buy this book, no one will do this. So I did all of them. I have a question. So you did not write any comedy at all this whole, any time before this, before you picked up this book? I mean, yeah, I I would like, I would like, uh, I did. Mess around? I did stand up a couple of times in college, like okay. at the college stand up thing. I did that like, All but right. you know, like l- less than 10 times for sure. Um, okay. and I, I was, uh, there was at one point I was in this group of, of people who were like trying to write a sitcom or something in Philly. And mm. I would like take the bus <laughs> for an hour and go to some guy's apartment. We would like brainstorm right. and I would So you'd like, been, you'd been dabbling. You'd been dabbling. Yeah, yeah. I did. I did like a, a, a uh, there was like a talent. They did a talent show at the kibbutz I lived on and the old pond sort of the tradition was that they <laughs> I just, had to I do. I want to let everybody know once again, um, Leo used air quotes when he said talent. <laughs> <laughs> well, the shade case, here is unbelievable. Yes. <laughs> in this case, it's completely appropriate. Uh, okay. We, so we, we wrote, I wrote. I, I wrote a bit with some people for because uh, we were we had to, we were told you have to do like a, a skit, like it's a tradition. So we did a skit for the whole kibbutz, and uh, we we killed like we did we did like because it was all about them, like making mm-hmm. fun of them. I mean, this is before Ooh. I knew anything about how that's a cheap trick, 
but it, it it worked. So that was good. I don't know. And I had done little things here and there, like amateur for fun stuff. And just being okay. a smart aleck, you know, being a smart aleck in life and laughing with your friends, all that. That's all good practice. Absolutely. Um, all right. So you so you dabble for a bit. You do a quote unquote talent show. You you but it seems like picking up this book and doing all the exercises was the first time you kind of like committed or made a clear decision that you want to at least give it a try. Well, I was sort of like, is this getting me in the, and then I wrote to the guy who wrote the book and he wrote no me way. back, which is unbelievable. How adorable. This is like way before email. Like he like wrote me a letter and he was very yeah. nice and like, you got to do it. You got to just go for it. And then I, um, what did you write so, him? Do you just wrote him? You just asked him, should I, I pursue this? I can't this? even remember. No, I, I think I was probably, I probably wrote him a letter, like on a typewriter. I wrote him a letter. I probably wrote this him like. This sounds very old timey. Yes. How do you, <laughs> how do you, how do you become a comedy writer? Like, what do I do? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then I, I took improv classes from these people in New York. Improv existed uh, before the internet? Yes, this is, this is pre, this is pre UCB. And oh, wow. I found this, there was this thing called, God, what were they called? I think I want to say they were called the National Improvisational Theater. And they were in Chelsea. And I took classes from them and they were, they were kind of, um, they were good. They were very good improv teachers. Um, and I met some of the people who then became like the first wave of UCB students. And I would like, there's like Mike Damn. Delaney, Mike Delaney and um, Linda Delaney, his wife and like uh, Billy Merritt and all these people. And they had a group called lost footage. It was like the, the best group of the, school and, and they, they would do shows and people would come see them and i would i would run their booth i would be the light and uh sound guy mm -hmm. uh, did tech, so yeah. The, yeah i was the tech guy and that was great like i would get to see them a million times and i started with my class we started our own group and we would perform like like literally we would perform like in the basement of a like a restaurant in the East village. And then we would perform mm -hmm. at like a, a men's shelter. One of, one of our members of our group, she was a social worker and we would perform at a men's shelter and we would perform, you know, wherever. Um, right. And, and it just like, you know, it just eventually adds up. Like you, you start to learn more and learn how to work in a group and, and then I started to do stand up. I finally like started to go to open mics. I figured that out from like backstage magazine. And then yeah. I started I started to do open mics and that's when I I was like, "Oh yeah, this is way more of a like you can really like you can do it all the time in New York." And then in New York there weren't like, you know, if you do it for real in New York for a month, you kind of know every Buddy, and you know the vibe, you know where to go, and so then, and then, then there weren't there weren't many people doing comedy because comedy was very uncool. Then it was like after the eighties crash, so there was not <laughs> many. So it was like only like you know a few people and a lot of dabblers, and very quickly mm -hmm. you learned who was serious. So you sort of you know, you sort of had to, you could you figure out those people. Yeah. And you saw like the people who were like ahead of me, you know, it was like Gaffigan and like, uh, you know, Attell and like, you know, this Ginny is the Garofalo. early nineties, right? Yeah. Early nineties. So it was like, yeah. Attell and Gaffigan. And I mean, Gaffigan was like at the very end of being an open micer, like Judah Friedlander. Okay. Damn. And, like, uh, like I just remember doing all these shows for nobody, just for other comics. So many shows where 
I remember one time like Rachel Feinstein, she must have been like 17. She was like running. Damn, a show, Rachel like, Feinstein's been doing it. She looks very young. I thought I mean, she was like know. she was she was definitely young. Not way to, not saying she's me. old, but I just couldn't believe I can't can't believe she was doing it in the 90s. This is probably Damn. a few years. This is probably a few years later, but she was like okay. I just have this memory of like her running a show like in the back of a restaurant, it's just like me, her, and Gina Friedlander performing for each other. And everybody Leo, else being, being annoyed. Don't take this the wrong way, but like, it sounds like you've been doing comedy for a hundred years. I feel like I have been. It, I mean, it, I was it, like... My, my entrance like, and my experience is so different. <laughs> you have no I mean, internet. I was, I was watching... Just the fact like, that there's no young, internet. Yeah. I would go and watch like... I, w- I remember one time in the snow, it was like a snowy night. And I went to the cellar to watch with my friend Kelly Kirsten. And the show was, it was like Attell, Todd Berry, um, Marin, um, Wanda Sykes, who was then Wanda Sykes Hall. And like, uh, Daryl Hammond, but all of them. So we watched them for like an hour and a half, and it was like six people in the audience. Jesus Christ. So we were just Same. sitting in the back watching like the best comedian. Like even then, they were, I mean, I don't yeah. think any of them were famous then, but to us, we were like, this is unbelievable. And I remember That's what's it was crazy. Like, it was a snowy night. I, I think it tell comes down and he goes, now who's an idiot for buying a snowmobile? <laughs> <laughs> that is what's crazy about doing comedy in New York. I started in New York, and you definitely get the sense, even at these very shitty shows that where there's no one, that you're watching the next generation of big comics. There's definitely that vibe. Oh, yeah. I mean, then then you see them the people below you blow past you. <laughs> <laughs> that happens sometimes as well. And that's, that's fine. That's, you know, that's it is how it works. It is. That's fine. Yeah. You know, listening to you talk, it makes me feel like anybody who's interested in breaking into comedy, breaking into television with the advent of the internet, they, you essentially have no excuse. Like you have so much information at your fingertips. Like you literally had to dig and find your community. Thank God you were close to New York. It just makes you feel like, yeah, nobody has any excuse. If you're interested, the information is out there. There's so much information out there and access that, uh, there's just, uh, no excuse. That's it. Leo Allen did it before. I, I feel like if I started now, I would be like, oh, there's too many people doing it. It's impossible. It's, it, it's, it definitely. I, I, I would be too intimidated. I'd be like, forget it. When you started, who was like the, who were like the, the big comics in New yeah. York? Or like, what were the big venues? Yeah, I, um, I was really, I started with, uh, I started at the People's Improv Theater and then I moved mm-hmm. on to UC- UCB and then I started doing stand-up and I I got on a team at the People's Improv Theater, but I, I had already gotten deep into stand-up and I really wanted to pursue that. And I eventually left that team and um, I was really into Hannibal Burris at the time. He was He was like, you know, ahead of me and he was the person that I was kind of like, Watching, mm-hmm. I feel like there's always mm-hmm. for standups. There's always this one comic that kind of like you model your work after, and I, I felt like Hannibal kind of he kind of just taught me how to write my jokes because he just it just he was just talking in a way that I felt I I understood and that you know it, it just made me feel like oh that's how I would say my joke or that's how I write this thing that I, this idea that I have like he he was just weird and interesting and I really liked him. Um, yeah, yeah, he, I, he, I, he was very prominent, I, I but there were so many Hannibal, other people. Yeah. I remember when Hannibal showed up. Yeah. He pretty much yeah. already had his voice down. Yeah. Like some Cause he came from never, Chicago. Yeah. He had already done so much work, but yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, but it's still like some people never kind of 
figure out their own voice. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Which is a shame. Um, it's hard. I feel like I was yeah. always struggled with that. I with also, your voice? Oh, I, yeah, I feel like as a stand-up, I always felt like it was so hard to like, like who am I? <laughs> who am I? I mean, I was also always in a duo <laughs> for a long yeah. time. I was in a duo mm-hmm. like simultaneously, me and Sloven, and that that felt more sort of like we knew to a certain extent what our vibe, what our tone was, I guess, because we would argue, not argue, but we would like have to both agree to do a thing. So it kind of narrowed us down in a good way. It wasn't like we thought about that, but. That's so surprising because when I first saw you at Whiplash, that was the first time I ever saw you. I thought you you were doing um, a bit on the guitar and um I don't remember what the bit was, but I just remember it fucking killing. Like the like everybody was dying. <laughs> I was dying. And I just thought you were so original and so funny and so confident. I wouldn't have thought that you didn't feel Do you do you think that you still feel that way or are you over that? I think no, I think I think by then I kind of at times or and you know, maybe half and half felt like I like the thing that was good for me about Whiplash, and thank you for saying that. The thing that was good for me about having to host every week was like, the like it took us like a couple months to get an audience. Like, cause after like two or three months, it was always completely packed every time. And then it was like really fun. And everybody mm-hmm. wanted to be, you knew people wanted to be there cause it was 11 o'clock on a Monday, which is the worst time. Yeah. So it was yeah. a, always a, almost always a great audience who was into whatever. And I would always try to, with Jeremy, who booked it, to like tell people, like, you don't have to do like your A stuff. You can like try something. Like, you don't have to, but like, we're not going to not book you. Like, we know you're funny. So you're, you're not like auditioning. So just do what you want. So, and I would try to do that myself because for the first couple weeks or month, like our first week was me, Kamel, and Zach Galifianakis. And there was like 23 people there. Uh, okay. Um, and then like a couple weeks later, I would do, I was kind of doing like my, my, my A material at the beginning of the show. And then like week three, some lady was like, we heard it. <laughs> these motherfucking have, new york audience <laughs> we've heard i like it, how Leo. invested we've they are it. <laughs> and i was like i was so mad i was like are you fucking kidding me but then i was like you know what she's right like she's should, right dude i should use this as like like what am i doing like i don't need to tell the jokes i know work i love that until yeah, i, I hate that. them yeah. So, and people are coming because they know there's going to be great comics. They're not coming to see me. So, I was, that made me always do something new every time. And that's why I started to talk to Sharon at the beginning of the show. Like that yeah. just became, you know, just naturally happened. It became a bit. And then I would do that. And then I would try to try something new. And I'd try to keep it tight just so people would have energy for the show. So that was good for me. That that kind of made me develop my own sort of feel in a way I hadn't been able to until then. You know what I want to I want to ask you about? Um, like, are you an introvert? <laughs> are are you shy? Yeah, I think I'm an introvert. I think a lot of comics are who I know. Yeah, don't you a think? Lot of Do you comic- think you're an introvert? Yeah. I'm absolutely an introvert. I'm uh, you're very you're very um it's one of the reasons I feel like I was drawn to you when we first met was just like you're just very like low key. There's no other way to describe you. <laughs> like you're just very low key. You're very like uh you're very sweet and kind, I think, Leo. Like you're just like a very sweet kind human and you're just very chill. Is this is it hard for you t- was it hard for you to perform as a introverted or shy person i 
I, I think it was kind of unnatural. Like I wasn't like, you know, there's certain people we all know who are like naturally like a performer. Right. And that right. was definitely not me. But I think I kind of, you know, you can, you learn from doing. That's what's good about stand up as opposed to just being like, I'm going to write scripts in a room. It's right. like you're, you're, you're told for real in real time whether or not people think what you're doing is funny. Uh, I love and that about kinda, stand up. It's kind of like undeniable. And the same yeah. is with like me, me and Sloven performing. Like we found out real. <laughs> real brutally if people were on board or not yeah have you ever and become bu- kind of numb to it or is it still does it still hurt your feelings if people don't laugh no i think it i think it's a bummer but i felt like i got to the point where i i kind of made a deal with myself where like if i know that i've like done the work and i'm ready then if they hate me i I got to the point where I could kind of enjoy it if I was bombing. If I felt okay. like I was, if I had done it right. I kind of learned that from watching uh, Garofalo when an audience wouldn't like her. I, I had so long where I would like get, get mad and go after the audience and like, not be like, you should be laughing, but just like mm-hmm. be angry but she would do this thing where she'd be like, Hey, I'm really sorry. Like you were expecting something else and this is your night out. And I know that this isn't your cup of tea. <laughs> like She was just like <laughs> legitimate. Like she wasn't being sarcastic. She was like legitimately being real and empathizing. Sorry. And then she'd be like, but some people here are enjoying it. So could you not like be a dick, you know? <laughs> So how did this all, all of this time spent at UCB, uh, how did this translate into essentially breaking into TV? I hate saying it too. I hate saying breaking into TV, but that's, that's the term. So how'd you do it? I think it's just like, it's just like if you're, if you stick around and you're really out there doing it, you just eventually people know you. Mm-hmm. If you're in the mix, uh, and I was in the mix forever, and I was always doing stuff with Sloven. We were always putting on, we would put on these hour-long shows that we would do. I think we did like five or six of them. And that was like great practice for TV writing. We didn't think of it like that, but we were writing like tons of sketches. And we would write like, I think for our first show, we wrote like, like 70, and we picked like nine that we did. Holy crap. Um, and and then we were still too dumb that we <laughs> when we would like three of them didn't ever really work, but we were never smart enough to be like, well, let's just cut them out of the show. <laughs> mm-hmm. We just kept doing them. But, you know, you learn, you slowly learn like, oh, yeah, you can cut stuff and you can. And, and then like, oh, so we get hired to write on uh this like internet thing. It was the first time we were shown the internet. It was like 1996 or seven. And it was a show called, this is not a test. And it was the people hired to write for it. were like, it was run by um, Nick McKinney, Mark McKinney's brother. And this guy, Vito Viscomi, who were really funny Canadians who were in a group called the vacant lot who had a TV show for a little bit on comedy central, I think. And then they ran this internet show that Microsoft, I think was paying for. And they hired me and Slovin and then they hired Todd Barry and they hired the UCB uh, was writing for it. The original four and Mm -hmm. um, this guy, Dan O'Sullivan and uh, this guy, Mike Lee, uh, probably a couple other people and we would like write sketches every day and go in and I was writing I was I, I think Matt Walsh from UCB was my roommate by then so we were roommates for like two and a half years mm-hmm. so I was just like comedy 24 7 and then then after like maybe like six months of that job 
um, Marin, they decided to do a live version of it too. And Marin was the host. So, you know, we were working with Mark and uh, I think Greg Fitzsimmons came in a row for it. And like, you know, so you're just around doing stuff and we were always doing our own shows and I was doing stand up. It was like mm-hmm. all yeah. comedy all the time. Uh, I was living with Matt Walsh. Like we were it was just talking about comedy. Yeah. And I was I, were... I was living with our Armando Diaz too, who started the Jesus Christ. Like Matt brought Armando into our apartment. Mm-hmm. And so those guys were always there. So it was like it was never ending thinking and 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 writing comedy. And then after after that show, I can't remember when that ended, but we got it we went to me and Slovin went to Aspen Comedy Festival a couple of times. And one year we got like a little deal with Jim Henson Productions and that didn't go anywhere. But then we got a deal with FX and we actually made a pilot. Um, which didn't get made into a show, but you know, again, it's like a great experience and you learn the huge mistakes you made and why it didn't get picked up and how not to let that happen again, how to stand up for yourself. Ooh, hold that thought. We're going to take a quick little break and then I want to hear about how to stand up for yourself. I'm quickly interrupting this episode to tell you about theworkingwriter.com. It's a resource I created for screenwriters and creative entrepreneurs that includes a blog, a course, and this podcast. Right now, when you sign up for the mailing list, you'll get my free guide to breaking into television. It's everything I've learned about breaking in, and it's basically what I've said to any writer who's asked to pick my brain over coffee. If you're working on breaking into TV, I hope it gives you some concrete steps to get to the next level in your journey. Go to theworkingwriter.com and sign up for the mailing list now to download your free guide to breaking into TV. Are you a screenwriter who's feeling stuck or lost or just wanting to take your career to the next level? Then you need to check out The Working Writer School. The Working Writer School is an online course and community I created that trains screenwriters to become creative entrepreneurs who can confidently navigate building a professional network, attract managers and agents, manage their personal finances, pitch a TV show, and consistently produce original work they're proud of. When you join with one of our flexible membership options, you'll get the course, plus live monthly virtual workshops with writers from Portlandia, American Dad, The Last OG, and more. Go to theworkingwriter.com slash school and sign up today to get training, mentorship, and support from a community of writers just like you. Now, back to the episode. And we're back. So you were talking about a deal you got with FX and um, a pilot that you made that didn't get made. And uh, you mentioned that it was a great lesson in... um, how to stand up for yourself and something else you said that I don't remember, but, but what was the lesson? Like, how do you stand up for yourself? Well, I think it's like, if you're a stand up, you kind of stand up for yourself by not doing hacky things that, you know, will get a laugh. Okay. Like once you do stand up for a while, you, you, there's like tricks you can do that will get a laugh. But then you, you're giving your creativity cancer and you'll never evolve into the thing that makes you unique, which is what all the good, like that's what happens to Hannibal Burris. He sticks to his guns and he becomes Hannibal. But he's mm-hmm. probably first imitating, you know, Mitch Hedberg and whoever else. Like, you know, we all are. I, I'm, I'm starting out, I'm imitating like, Gaffigan and and Todd Barry and 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 Mark Marin and then Attell for sure and then you're you're like and then I'm imitating Garofalo and then you're like figuring out your own voice out of that uh, hopefully and so so you so you think originality or like continuing to push yourself creatively is is one way to stand up for yourself 
Yeah. And then if you get to the point where you're lucky and you get to make something with people who have money, like a network or something, Mm -hmm. it's hard to learn how to like, you know, I guess you have to, I mean, I don't, I still don't know how to do it, but you kind of get better maybe at like not being like, fuck you. You don't know anything about comedy, you fucking idiot. Like I'm going to do it this way. (laughs) Because you're like, oh, that doesn't work. People don't like that. But but no. but you but you gotta you gotta be like, you know what? We can't. If we do it like this, it's not going to be good. And I'm out. Like, I'm not doing it. If if that's the way you want so, to do so it. So that was the experience. You you basically had to be like, uh, you had to make a choice about whether or not it was going to be funny, or if you were going to do something you didn't kind of stand by. I think we were just a little bit too like we weren't we weren't taking enough responsibility to be like we're gonna like we're gonna be like this and like we're going to like the people I've worked with and seen be like really hands on and those those are the people who are have the funniest product. Yeah. It's like, Absolutely. I don't, I, I don't think, uh, Cosby, when he did the Cosby show was like, yeah, whatever. Like <laughs> I'll just read the script. <laughs> and sure. I, you know, I've, re- I've read the story about like how Seinfeld and Larry David were like, well, if we can't do it the way we want to do it, we're just not going to do it because I can just make money doing stand up. So if you want to do a show where I have to do a, B or C, I'm, I'm not interested. And that's why that show is good. Yeah. hundred percent. I mean, there's also like luck and there's like timing and yeah. casting, but this is a very, this is very, uh, deep into the process though. This is like, if you get to make a show, I mean, some people get lucky. I have known people who, who their first writer's room was the sh- a show that they wrote, um, which is insanely rare. And it's really hard. And if that show even makes it so far as a writer's room, which some sometimes it usually doesn't even make it that far, um, that's an insanely tight rope to walk, <laughs> which is learning how to navigate uh, all, all the cooks. You know, there's so many cooks in the kitchen. Um, but that's like that's like uh, uh, that's you know champagne problems, pretty much. Yeah. 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 So you've worked both. So basically you, your way break your way that you broke in was just being a comedian, just performing a lot and then oh, working a really slowly. A hundred percent. If I would have just I mean, I don't know how you do it, just like sending in scripts. Or I mean, also I was in New York, so yes. there was no like writer's assistant moving up model in New York. Like I didn't even understand what a writer's assistant was until I moved to LA. So what was your experience like then in your first writer's room? So in your first writer's room was like, was it long after you'd sold a show and done all that other stuff? No, you'd been, you were in that internet room. Well, yeah, that, that, that that was kind of like a writer's room, but you would kind of mostly go off and like write your own thing. I mean, me and Slovin were like, that was very much like what writer's room I've seen. We were like a mini writer's mm-hmm. room with the two of us. Mm-hmm. It's very similar. And then my first real writer's room was probably, well, the, the, yeah, the, yeah, the internet thing was, was kind of a writer's room. And then I guess SNL was really the first, the first, because we wrote our pilot that we shot ourselves. So that was kind of the, what we'd been doing, and then the SNL. That yeah, that was a that was a writer's room. That that was, but it, it's not How a writer's that room as in an a experience. Way. It's not. It it also has people going off and writing their own work. Yeah, and kind of com- yeah, coming back very, and pitching it to the rest of the the room. Yeah, it's a very specific. Uh, yeah. situation SNL, or at least it was when, when I was there. I think it's probably similar it's similar um, same person still runs it so what was that experience like uh it was good i mean it was you know it was weird it was like yeah to be at snl and 
it was kind of like we had been around in New York for like a long time, like eight or nine years. And we had sort of not even considered it as a possibility. And then it sort of came out of nowhere. And, uh, but we knew, we knew a lot of people. So it wasn't as scary as it might've been. Like we knew, yeah, like really... Amy, we knew Amy and we knew like mm-hmm. Tina and we knew, we knew some of the writers and we knew some of the cast. So it wasn't quite as terrifying, but you know, it's like, okay, I hope we can keep up. But it's, it's like a free, you know what it is? It's free, it's free grad school for comedy because you learn, you know, you have to be a producer. You have to produce your own sketch. So you got to talk to all the departments. You, you have to be responsible. So in that sense, it's like an amazing amount of le- a great learning curve that you, you can't really get anywhere else. So you've worked both as a uh, writer in the writer's room as well as a showrunner. And um, how has that transition been? Like to not even, you know what? I don't want to ask about the transition. Which one do you prefer? What Do you prefer show running or do you prefer just being in the writer's room? Well, I like show running, I'd say, just because you know, you're, you're, you have more power. Like you're, you're there. I mean, I like being a writer, but if you're, I mean, show running is such a, it's a term that I, it didn't even exist when I started. I feel like it's now become this like, to me, it, it means like, if you're the showrunner, you're kind of like the tone police. That's how I look at it. Yeah. Like you're <laughs> trying to make sure that everybody is on the same show and writing the same show. And that the outside forces aren't trying to force you to make your show what it's not. Uh, but yeah, it's 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 just more. You have more. You have more decision making. So that's yeah. like kind of more. If you're going to be there anyway, you might as well have more responsibility. You don't I find think. it overwhelming. It, it can be over. <laughs> It can be, but it lo- but, I, know, it looks overwhelming as fuck. Just just looking at it, but so can being a writer. You know, it's kind of sometimes as a writer, you're just like you're just like, why am I even here? Like this is like <laughs> it's like pointless. Like it's like I mean, sometimes you feel that way as a showrunner too, to be honest. But I I just think it's, it's the frustrations are inherent. So I think I'd rather have more. I like it when it's, you know, I've only kind of been showrunner stuff that I'm, or mostly just stuff that I sort of thought of. So it's more, Mm -hmm. it's like if I was ever, you know, able to direct a movie that I wrote. Yeah. It's like, would you rather just write a screenplay or would you want to direct it? It's like, you want to direct it. I feel like a lot of writers get into directing because they're like, then if someone messes it up, I'd rather it was me. Like, yeah, I want, I want people for power. To try to... Just say it's for power. <laughs> yeah, but I don't think it's like a malevolent sense. It's in like I want this thing to have the best chance to be what I. It's not because I think it's cool. I, I think it's because you're like I'm. It's like when you're a stand-up, you're kind of a control freak. You're like I am that, responsible. I was just gonna. I was just gonna say maybe it's not power. It's just control. Yeah. It's like, yeah, it's like me and Slovan. Like, we were the only two people deciding what we were going to do. Right. Right. And, and control is 100% why I love stand up. It does feel that I got my little semblance <laughs> of control, even if it's an illusion, but I'll take right. it. You, you, you always yeah. have Charlotte. You always have Charlotte Island to fall back on. 100%. 100%. It does. It, that is a that was a weird thing that happened a few years into writing TV. Not even a few years. I would say even my first year writing TV because it took so much time and I wasn't able to do as much stand up, and I lost so much autonomy that you know stand up definitely became a refuge um, for autonomy because in TV there's just so many cooks in the kitchen. When you start out as a creator 
like I did. And I have so much control over the final product. And then it's, it's not that I can't be a part of a team. Like I, you know, I've done improv and all that other stuff. I just prefer (laughs) to do, to have, to have a say, you know, or a strong say. Totally. Well, it's, it's also like, isn't it like, you know, if you're, if you're a funny writer, you can do the job. You don't have to love the show. You can be like, I, yeah. I can, I can come in. I can, I can, I can put up the wallpaper and make the room look great. But it's more exciting if you're like, this is something I want people to see. Like, I'm excited for people to mm-hmm. see this. I think that's always. I think I read an interview with Amy, or I heard Amy Schumer talking and saying like. I like it when I feel like I'm, I have this feeling of like, I can't believe I'm going to get away with this. <laughs> like I, I feel like that's a good way. You want to feel like, I can't believe I'm going to get away with this. And I'm excited to show it to people. Ooh, damn. I love that. I can't believe I'm going to, I've never felt that really. <laughs> I don't, I don't think I've ever written, you know, in a way that made me feel like I was kind of like, pushing the envelope necessarily. I kind of feel like the envelope pushed so much, at least when I started that, like, I don't know. I don't know what I could write that would like really push the envelope. I mean, I don't think it has to be like pushing the envelope, but just like surprising people or being so unbelievably dumb that people can't Mm -hmm. believe you're actually, I mean, I felt like that's probably like a lot of what Sloven and I's thing would be to be like doing something that people would just be like why why would (laughs) why would you you would you went to so much effort to do something so stupid i cannot believe it i love it so when when you're when you're i guess putting a writer's room together you know or when you're in a writer's room are there traits that you notice that that you just like about other writers? Like, are, are there things that you notice a, a, about other writers that you particularly like? If that, if that question came out, you know, in any way that makes sense. Well, I like, I like that. I think the advantage of a writer's room to just sitting by yourself is, isn't the whole point that like, if I'm by myself, I'll slug it out and I'll, I'll rewrite something like a thousand times <laughs> to make it make any sense or be funny. But, but with a writer's room, like one person will say one thing. And then because of that, someone else will say another thing. And then because of that, someone else will say another thing. And then the first person will say like, Oh, what about this? And then you'll be at an idea that no one ever would have had on their own. I think that's like, and because it's comedy writers are f- funny and or the good ones are funny and they think of things that are unique to them and that no one else would think of. That's what you want, right? You want the person who is going to come up with something that uh, no one else would. Right. Are you still performing? Do you perform? I haven't performed much for, for a while. Um, but I have a little bit, but not really. I, I, it's weird. It's, I spent so much time performing all the time, but now I, I mostly kind of write, produce and direct stuff. Uh, it's just so time consuming, like to, to perform sure. and, I never got to the point where I could like make a decent living being a stand up. I mean, the, the year or two I made most of my money doing stand up for really thin years. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, you know, I was never good at, you gotta like, I never like tried to like have a following or, I wasn't, I wasn't really very smart. I was kind of just like, I like comedy and I'm just doing my thing. I don't like, I'm not going to make an email list. It's too boring. (laughs) 
Like I did, I was like, I was basically a lazy and averse to anything that felt like work, which is probably not the smartest way to go about it. I was kind of like, I'll just see where this takes me. Would you do it differently if you had it to do again? Yeah, I think I would be like, maybe I should like learn about business and be <laughs> like, I think when I started doing stand up, like I was like, I'm not going to like fucking be a lawyer or have some shitty job. I'm just going to do whatever and like be a stand up and be like, you know, I'm, I'm like an artist. Like I just do whatever, man. I'm not going to like figure out how to monetize it. Uh, but that's probably moronic. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I, I remember do one love time when people I, don't like uh, who who don't ever want to think about money because I'm just like, we all need money. You need money. I know, I know. But I guess I like never had a family for so long or wasn't married. I was just like, I would always like have enough. I could always mm-hmm. figure out a way to make my rent and. Mm-hmm. eat. Lauren Michael said it to us once, like coming back to work like one year and he saw us in the elevator and he was like, you know, at some point you probably should make it a business. And then we were kind of And like, did he mean like to get a corp or did he mean to like... I think he meant like, literally. you know, take yourself seriously. Seriously. And like, mm-hmm. and like, you know, you guys are sort of like, I don't know what you're doing. <laughs> But he was right, like, obviously. And now I take it seriously and like, or for a while now, but I think I was always kind of like, you know, I'm just kind of figuring it out and whatever. I'm just kind of surfing. You're such a, you're such a surfer. Well, like some, some people are like, I felt like, especially when I was starting out, certain people were like so over the top, like, I have a list. Is this my yeah, and I'm like, <laughs> blah, blah, blah. And, it, and it was like, well, those people are the unfunny people. <laughs> Which was a I have a website. <laughs> no, but I mean, like, you know what That's I mean. Good. You know what I mean. Like, I know what you mean. I'm... There are people who are like forgetting to be funny. Yeah, these weren't. The, these aren't people who are still doing it now. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So you just didn't prioritize that stuff. But what you're saying is if you could go back, you'd you'd take it a little bit more seriously as, as a as a business. Yeah. I mean, I think that I I was definitely like I'm going to be like one thing I was like when I was an open micer and when I was first doing stuff with Slovin, we were both like, I'm going to make this my job. And then after like four or five years, I quit my temp job because I got hired to write for that internet thing. Mm -hmm. And that was like the biggest thing. Like nothing has ever felt as good as that. Like, I think I went back to my apartment and I cried. I was so happy. (laughs) I'm I'm like a comedian now. Like I don't have to do another job. Which is like, yeah. you know, fucking making That's copies the dream. at some law firm. Yeah. What's become of Sloven? Where's that guy? He does, he's still writing and and producing stuff. And like, he worked on Broad City. Like, he, he sort of ran their room for a few seasons. And he's, he's always doing something. He's always got something. And sometimes we'll talk about working on something together. We had, we had a, we had a script on the blacklist a a bunch of years ago that we wrote together, but nothing ever came to that. Yeah. I think if I did it differently, I'd be like, what do I want to do? I think I definitely had a plan of like, how am I going to make this my job? But then I was never until, you know, five or 10 years ago, I was never like, okay, what am I going to do next? Yeah. So what do you think you're going to do next? <laughs> well, I'm writing, I'm always writing a bunch of stuff. I like, have a bunch of stuff I'm uh, about to go out with, with 
different people. I think now I'm like, I'm just going to put more stuff out there, finish more stuff. I put it out there. I have a movie script I wrote a year or two ago that I'm still like determined that even if it, someday before I die, I'm going to make this movie. You have to make I don't this care movie. what it, I don't care what it takes. And I'm, you know, it's hard to get a movie made as you know, the more you look into it, the more you realize how hard it is. But I'm also like, I have the time to like watch a bunch of movies and think about what makes a good movie and learn about the camera and why you shoot a thing a certain way. So, so you sort of look at it as an advantage. It's like, you know, everything takes time and I'm just trying to write, I'm just writing all the time and putting it out there and hopefully get to make stuff. What is, what is your, um, when you're not in a room or when you're not, uh, when you're not show running, what does your writing schedule look like? What is, what is finishing, starting a project, taking it from start to finish look like? Well, I think it depends on the project, but I think I, as I get older, the, I think consistency is, important like when you're first starting stand up right you have to be consistent because if you don't go out a lot especially at the beginning you're never going to get any good so you got to be consistent and then you realize like a lot of my peers are going to see me all the time so i got to write new jokes so you have that but so now i'm trying to be consistent in a different way like i try to write every day and now i have a kid so i got to get my writing done early so I get up early and I write. But there was times in what my time? life I'd write. <laughs> I try to get up at like <laughs> five. Okay. Because yeah, it's the only time, time, only time I have like two hours. And do you do kind myself. of like a Stephen King thing where you like try to write like, I think Stephen King does like 5,000 words. I can't remember. Or he does a chapter or something. Do you have like a set amount that you try to write every morning? Uh, no, it, it depends on like, you know, some days it might be like right now I'm trying to finish writing a script. So now I'm working on that. So I'm like. And is this your own like, script on spec or is this like. This is my you know, own hi- script hired on, to write on this? spec. This is, mm-hmm. this is all on spec. This is something I want to pitch. But yeah, so I work on that for for the time, or you know, maybe one day I'll be like, oh, I, I want to write this short story. Mm-hmm. Try to, I, I feel like writing different kinds of things. I find it helpful because then when you go back to the other thing, you have like fresh, fresh. eyes and, and you're yeah. excited, and you yeah. get better. You get better by doing any kind of writing. So what does it, does it, how do you feel like you've been productive for the day? Like, how do you know, like, is it like you're writing a scene, you're just rewriting something? Like, what are you doing for those two hours or what are you trying to make a little progress? Like sometimes Mm -hmm. I might say like, I got to write three pages. Other times I might say like, I'm having a problem with this scene. So I'm going to try to figure this out. Mm -hmm. And, and also I feel productive because I know like, you know, I don't turn on my phone. I don't look at the internet. I don't, I'm only, I can do this or I can do nothing. Like I can sit there and do nothing. That's fine. Or I can write, but I can't do yeah. anything else. Because otherwise, like if you're looking at the, or for me, like if I'm looking at the news, or if I'm checking my email, it's just like, it's a waste of time. Yeah. I'm still struggling to be, to have a consistent writing time. Like what I do is I'll like do like block scheduling where Monday and Wednesday I work on my script. And then another day I do something else because I always get very bored when I'm doing the same thing over and over, but I'm starting to get the sense that I'd be better off writing for like an hour or two every morning instead of trying to do this kind of like block scheduling. I'm not sure. Well, I think, it, you know, right. Don't you, I feel like you got to play around with what works for you. Right. And then yeah. it'll probably change depending on what's going on in your life. And like, 
if you're in a room, then you got to figure out a different time to like, I know for me, the morning, right. then I feel like I, then I feel like I did something. So I feel better for the rest of the day. And yeah. also, of course, you always, you're inevitably going to have like a large amount of days when you're just like, well, that was garbage. <laughs> Uh, but at least, at least you put the thought into it, and then right. So, are you uh, doing it like, uh, yeah? Are you doing it like? Are you doing the beat sheet first, and then the outline, and then this, and then moving on to script, or are you just starting uh, I, straight I, up? It, that depends on the thing. I, I normally at this point, I think I normally do like a, a beat sheet or whatever. And this this time, I did I did a. I did like a, or an outline and then I revised it a few times, but then at a certain point you got to just write. Right. And then, right. then it's only when you start to write that you realize how bad your outline is. Yeah. And then, and then you gotta, then you gotta, <laughs> then you gotta work on the fly and try to figure it out. Uh, and then yeah. you gotta re, I don't know, however, whatever works for you is what I say. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, um, uh, I used to just go straight into a script, and that was a terrible, terrible idea. Now I've gone. Yeah, uh, now I, I, I just straight I've, up start with a beat too. sheet. Yeah. Now yeah, I straight I've, up I've start done, with a beat done, sheet. I've done straight to script too. That's that's yeah. always becomes a. Some people can do it, but for me, it just becomes yeah. a pile of pile of garbage. It's a pile of garbage. It's just a mess, and it's a bunch of useless scenes that have no correlation to each other and don't make sense. So I always have to go back to the beat drawing board. Get a beat sheet together and then um and in its most simple form like a very undetailed just straight up what is the skeleton of this story because then i because that's what always messes me up when i get into the script um but yeah i'm gonna I, I'm, I'm still playing around with my my process i feel like sometimes i'm like i'm i'm deep into my 30s and i'm like am i ever gonna get a process i feel like i should have a process at this point I feel like it's it's always changes though, right? I, I don't know. For me, I feel like more and more it's like I got to like when you feel like you know the character and you know the tone, then it becomes like I've written for shows where I know the voice of the character and then it's like, that's easy. I can, I can like, I can write Andy Daly as Boris McNeil. It's, it's easy. I love that voice. That voice is great. He's so clear as to what the voice is Mm -hmm. and i guess you also know that andy daly will check it (laughs) (laughs) he's he's a great writer so you have like a a backup i'm really struggling with consistency it's something that i'm 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 working on because i'd like to be consistent so I gotta. I'm. I'm working on chipping away at what to, how to do that. I've been really into Cal Newport to try to help me with that. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I've read yeah. those books. Those are good. Yeah, yeah. You yeah, know, I those think I books. am. I'm always struggling with consistency. I think it's. I think it's always a struggle. I think. I don't yeah. know. I to, to me, it's like. I feel like now I'm like I gotta like know if I'm deluding myself and. <laughs> at, a, at a certain point you got to put like that's what's good about a job like mm-hmm. where you, the job you just had it's like you know okay charlotte well your script is due hand it mm-hmm. in or you're fired exactly exactly <laughs> but when, when you're exactly. writing your own when you're writing your <laughs> when you're writing and that's easy to deal with you're just like well i guess yeah. i have to stay up all night or whatever yeah Abs- but, and, but then, I, and that's but, very easy but with your own but with your own thing you're like i'm not gonna stay up all night to write this absolutely not who Spectre. cares about it? I'm the only one who does. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm chipping away at that because because I do think that it's worthwhile. Like, I think the satisfaction of of consistently putting out essays or whatever it is that I want to put out, it, it feels it, I imagine that I would be very worthwhile and very satisfying. So I, I would like to get there. Yeah. there's nothing better. Like, physician heal yeah. thyself. Like, I I'm I hear you. That's what I'm trying to do more too yeah and i and i'm i stopped putting a timeline on it like i don't think that you know i I don't think that there's any real race here (laughs) because it's my own stuff that i'm putting out because i want to so i'm just slowly but surely chipping away at what can i do to be more consistent with the work that kind of like fills me up and that i just want to do because i want to do it 
Exactly. Um, so every so everything everything you do, don't you think that everything you do and finish is like unbelievably helpful? Like you learn something from it. You you do. I do. Yeah. Um, but I've still not been able to figure out how, how to do that consistently. <laughs> so I'm going to try to figure out, you know, how do I create my own consistency without, you know, somebody having to pay me for it, essentially. Um, <laughs> well, that, that's, the, that's, yeah. the, that's the eternal struggle, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I feel like I think it's is- worthwhile. I, I agree. I feel like that yeah. is exactly where I'm at too. And I think the one thing I do help, I think is the flip side of that is like getting really in, keeping yourself excited to like learn stuff. I do think that is one thing that I, I, you know, I've been, I've been doing a lot of work and trying to be like, this is what I like about myself. <laughs> so <laughs> that's, that's where this sentence is coming from. <laughs> but I do like that, which is that I, am always learning new things. I'm excited to learn new things. I'm excited to relearn the same things too, to make sure that I I have it down well. Like I'm in a script writing class right now um, with somebody new and, you know, just learning from somebody new. And it's, it's always fun to learn from somebody new. And, And that's not what I'm necessarily afraid of in terms of like, you know, not learning anymore. It's really just like, yeah. Uh, just that consistency and that focus. My focus is also something that's been really fucked lately <laughs> that I've really had to rein yeah. in. Uh, yeah. Cal Newport. Absolutely. That's why I've been deep into Cal Newport right now. But um, I'll, I'm going to ask you one last question, Leo, because you've been with us for, for quite some time and I really appreciate it so much. Um, but you've been in TV for what seems like a hundred years at this point and the, <laughs> the industry has changed so much what do you think TV looks like in the future? Um, do you think about the future of TV? Do you think the future of TV writing? I, I don't, I have, yeah, I have, I, I kind of think about it, but I, I feel like we're at a, in the middle of like an inflection point, if that's the right mm-hmm. term, like things are changing. I feel like everybody's panicked and freaking out top yeah. to bottom. Uh, yeah. because everything is different. Like everything, it's like you look at these numbers and it's like, well, like, I don't know, 40 million people would watch Seinfeld every week. It's right, like, right. It's like now if 2 million people watch your show, you're like killing it. It's amazing, yeah. Um, <laughs> so it's a it's different, nuts. it's a total, and there's a billion things to watch. So I don't know what to say to anybody But I think if you constantly, I don't know, to me, the future of TV, at least for me, is like, you got to like, you got to like, I mean, sometimes you're going to have a job if you're lucky, but for what you are the source of, you got to like, focus on what you like and what you are truly interested and excited about. And hopefully someone else will like it. Uh, and you're also a craftsperson and an artist and you're getting better and, and maybe you'll get lucky. And I mean, there's so much luck involved. It doesn't matter. It's like, you know, if you're, it, you gotta, you gotta, it's gotta be cast right. You gotta like come in at the right moment in history. There's so much like. You, you mean luck involved in terms of a TV show being successful? Yeah, in terms of anything yeah. being said, a book, a, mm-hmm. a, a, a music album, a, a, mm-hmm. a movie, it's all like, even if you're like at the top of your game and everything, it's like if it's cast strong or if like something happens in the world that makes people not want to see that it's, or if another thing that's like it comes out right before that's huge, it's like, yeah. You can't worry about all that stuff. Like sometimes it it might not break your way, but I don't know. You get you, you, you got to you can only do what you got to do. <laughs> you got to do what compels you, right? Yeah. Absolutely. It's like if you if you just want to be a comedy writer for like something you hate, then like why not just be a lawyer? 
Right. That's what me and Salome used to always say to each other. Like, why not just be a lawyer or yeah. something? <laughs> you heard it here first, guys. Why not just be a lawyer? Go to there law school is. is the lesson. Go to law school. Learn. Yeah. It's a useful skill probably as a comedy writer. Actually, so many comedians are lawyers. Have you ever noticed There's that? so many. Yeah, there's tons. There's a lot of teachers also that are comedians. Yeah, also, yeah. Te- that makes sense because it's so performative. Yeah. I never thought of it teaching that way, but there are a lot of teachers that are comedy writers. Um, is there, what's next for you, Leo? What's, what's going on? Um, I'm just, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm like what you said. I'm, I'm trying to just trying to get some stuff out there, just finish stuff that I've been working on for a long time. Some by myself, some with, a bunch of different people and put it out there in the world and see if people like it as much as I do or we do. I love it. And, 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 you know, if, if you don't finish it and put it out there, you'll never know. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Leo. You're always one, one moment away from everything you wanted or from total disaster. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, God. (laughs) Well, that was Leo Allen. Thank you so much, Leo, for being on the podcast. Thank you, Charlotte. It's good good to talk to you. Leo is just the best. I hope you enjoyed the episode and I hope you appreciate the fact that you have the internet and you don't have to write letters to people to figure out things about comedy or TV writing. There's just so many resources, you know, including the Working Writer School. So I hope I see you there. Go ahead, check it out. Come through, come see me. That's all I got for now, guys. Thanks so much for listening. Until next time, you know what to do. Get out there, get to work. There's no way I could do this podcast alone. I wanted to give a big shout out and thank you to our editor, Justin Asher, and to our other production assistants, Jemima Lariston, Maya Ricole, and Nicole Edwards. Oh,